The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to the webinar, Maximizing Your Education at Home. I'm Amanda Scharf, the Chapter and Partner Relations Coordinator at NACE National. This presentation will be recorded and available in the resource library section of the NACE website. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to add them into the chat or questions section of this webinar. I'm here with Megan Ely, OFD Consulting Owner. She combines in the trenches event experience with a love of wedding PR to empower her clients to take their business to new heights. A longtime wedding a longtime industry speaker and writer, she is a Wedding Wire education expert, as well as a regular contributor to Wedding Planner Magazine, Wedding Business Magazine, Cater Source, and SpecialEvents.com, among others. You can also find her, find her sharing ongoing insight on the NACE national blog. More recently, she launched WeddingIndustrySpeakers.com, a go-to resource for in-demand event industry educators. And this year, Megan was a nominee for the Speaker of the Year at the 2019 NACE One Awards. Welcome, Megan, and her wonderful foster kitties. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I'm here, but I also come bearing foster cats. Anyone who, who knows me at all has heard me speak. I'm a, a resident cat lady, but we're actually fostering for a local shelter, which is filled to the brim with rescue animals right now. And so two are at the office today. So if we're lucky, by the end of it, maybe during q and I can, I'll put, I'll put on the webcam and <laughs> I've got them flying through the air with the greatest of ease right now behind me. So anyways, um, but anyways, thank you so much for having me. And it's so great to connect with everyone, especially, you know, now that I, I dare say we've almost recovered um, from Cincinnati. So it was great seeing all the folks that, of course, I ran into there. And I appreciate those um, taking the time to chat with me today, especially about something I feel so, so passionate about. Because the fact is, um, even though we have officially, I hopefully mainly recovered from NACE experience, which was wonderful. Cincinnati did a great job. Now, you know, the engine keeps moving. That's the thing. And the fact is, you know, at the local level, you're bringing in great education. You yourself might be a speaker and kind of have that on the brain right now. You're looking ahead. You might be someone in a position, even outside of NACE, to potentially be picking and selecting speakers for various events and workshops. And the next kind of question that comes is, how in the world do I make the most of that education? You know, it's one of those things that's so funny where we think that we go ahead and book and then the, oh, the work's done, now the speaker will come, but there's so much more to that. So first, thanks again for having me. Yes, I am currently in the midst of a NACE experience hangover. I'm not the only one, I'm sure. That's myself, Kevin and Morgan on the way. <laughs> it was to my very first gala, which I thought they did a great job. And so, yeah, like I said, the engine keeps turning. And the question is, how do I maximize this at home? The fact is, there's so many great chapters out there. I've been fortunate to, to have spoken at several of them myself so over, over the years. And of course, I'm a part of the Richmond chapter. And every chapter is going to be different in terms of what their needs are, uh, what their budgets are, and so on and so forth. Uh, but regardless of that, I'd like to think none of us have unlimited funds to bring in people all the time. And so we want to be able to maximize the investments that we do bring when we bring people in um, for that educational experience. And so I'm very passionate about really jumping in and saying, hey guys, it's great you've booked someone or you've been booked, but let's talk about how we really maximize that investment so that it's wonderful for you guys and the people who come and you see an increase in attendance and it's great for the speakers that, that are coming in and, and all of those things. And I also want to bear in mind the fact today, of course, that everyone out there who I'm speaking to, I'm really speaking to these folks today as volunteers. You guys all have full-time jobs, full-time things that you're taking care of. I myself recently was in charge of a, my six-year-old, of course, I got my husband, my partner in crime, but also in charge of thousands of cats, it felt like. Not really thousands, but many cats. And so we've been very busy. And so the idea of having to really do even more when it comes to booking these educational, these educators coming in and what have you, the fact is at the end of the day, there are just a few tweaks you can make to really maximize that experience. So um, I want to be mindful of the fact that we all have a million things going on. And I want to offer you to do's today that really are going to make a difference. 
in also being mindful of the fact, again, that you are a volunteer for an organization such as NACE. So let's go ahead. Now, as I say, and anyone who went to Cincinnati will appreciate this, your conference experience is only as good as, we say the bourbon at lunch, but what you do after said conference, after the workshop. And that's just a little shout out back to, of course, the lunch that we all attended at Cincinnati and an experience. If you didn't go, they gave us bourbon shots at lunch. Um, for anyone who knows me, I don't think I've taken a shot since college. So that was fun. Um, Rachel Sharon took a hilarious video of me and I, I was mortified as to watch it as I was to participate in it, but it was a lot of fun. So the, the fact is when it comes to your events, your association meetings, what it comes down to at the end of the day is it's not just about the education that you're doing, but it's what's happening after the fact as well. It's it's not just the takeaway sitting there with the speaker, but having that continued conversation after the fact too. And I really wanna dig into how we can do that with relative ease with just a few simple tweaks along the way. Also, Brian Palmer said, I've quoted him in the past, he's a past president for Nat National Speakers uh, Bureau. At the end of the day, there are far more events to choose from these days. I know it sounds crazy to think, oh, we're in competition with one another, but we are. We are hosting these events at the, the local level, even national level, but at this local level today, we're talking about regional chapters, and you're up against all the other organizations out there. There's ILEA, there's WIPA, um, there's uh, PMI, there's a bunch of Alphabet Soup organizations out there, ABC, and then there's also the local event industry um, organizations as well, wedding associations and whatnot. The fact is, these guys, it's gonna be very rare for an event professional to attend to every single one of them. And so how can you make sure that you have a steady presence, you're showing ongoing great education that will attract people, they'll keep coming, keeping the doors open, keeping more people coming in. And so you wanna be able to stand out, of course, with the education offerings that you have. And, and that leads to bigger things, that leads to you know applying for chapter of the year and programs of the year and all those things and so on and so forth. So. First, though, we have to dig in. So today we're really digging into the idea of how to maximize having education at the at the regional, local chapter level. But there are a few things we need to revisit now. If you've heard me speak on this before, I'm going to go over a couple of things. We're going to revisit a couple of slides from the last time, just as a reminder, because you know, it, selecting your speakers is really where it starts. Even though today we're talking about maximizing the education, assuming you've already booked a lot of these speakers, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share the fact, of course that we need to be very, very mindful of the fact that it's selecting, it starts with selecting the right people. Everyone's going to be different. I will tell you, I'm very high energy. I'm great for wedding and social. If you put me primarily in like a corporate event, you know, setting, I tend not to, my personality does not mesh as well. I don't mind saying that. I'm very anecdotal. There's humor in my talks. I'm not always the right fit. And whereas there are going to be other people who are going to be a better fit for that. So you really need to kind of dig in ahead of time. Things to consider. What's worked well um, with your chapter in the past? Like really think about what speakers really stood out. Why do you think they worked well? What has fallen short of expectations? We have to be tough on ourselves. Not every event is gonna be perfect. And is it because the person just wasn't a mesh? Maybe they're too uh, corporate. Maybe they're too social wedding and it's just not a good fit for your group. Maybe you find that people outside of the industry do better for you as well. It just really depends. So what fell short of expectations and dig in and really ask yourself why on that. Ask yourself, what topics have been overdone? Um, I have sat for a long time, I think almost five years now. You'll have, someone will have to fact check me at some point on that, but I did about five years on NACE National Education Committee for the conference. We get a ton of submissions for sales and marketing at the end of the day. And um, you know that's a very popular topic with good reason. Some people would contend in some sections that maybe they've done sales and marketing too much, so maybe they need to focus on catering a little bit, or maybe they've done a lot of food and beverage and need to go more into tech or design or what have you. So what topics have you felt have been overdone? And guys, do a competitor landscape, take a few minutes, see what your other local chapters of other organizations like WIPA and ILEA have done. I see a lot of people make that mistake and don't do that. And then we see a lot of like bookings where they're maybe too close together with similar topics. So just be kind of mindful of what other people are doing and say, 
what has been done a lot in, let's say, Boston or Atlanta or San Francisco and kind of go from there? And then what topics would be welcomed by our chapter? And that's just, that's a matter of taking a poll. We've got to be careful. We don't want to be too anecdotal about that sort of thing. So maybe send out a survey and get an idea of what people are, are interested in hearing about. Because I personally don't do as well with the inspirational talks. I tend to like the ones where it's like, these are, like, they could be inspirational, but I kind of want just the facts, ma'am. I want to know exactly how I can be better at my business, but maybe my fellow NACE members here in Richmond don't agree with that. And if you find the majority want something more inspirational um, and life-changing, Oprah asks, then consider doing that. But you go, you've got to go to your membership and see what they're looking for. As a refresher, there are typically three speaking styles too. Everyone's a little bit different. Memorize is exactly what it sounds like. People on stage who know exactly what they're, they're going to say every minute of the day. Oftentimes they have notes in front of themselves or an iPad, some sort of tablet where, and they're not necessarily reading off of, but they do know exactly what they're going to cover. Um, impromptu is the exact opposite. These guys, I'm not saying they're not practice, but impromptu comes in and does not follow an outline. Like it might be a very loose outline. And then you see extemporaneous. I'm actually extemporaneous for anyone who's seen me, seen me at experience or the chapters. Extemporaneous is, a, you know what you're going to say, but you're willing to evolve a little bit based on the crowd. I tend to like to read the energy of the crowd. A bunch of years ago and fought Fort Lauderdale for nice experience. I made this weird, like sometimes I say things, I'm like, where did that come from? But people like it. And I made a joke about a banana and the cost of the bananas at the fort, wherever we were having our wonderful experience, the bananas were like three bucks or something, very expensive. And so I got such a rise out of people on that, that I mentioned bananas a few more times and went off the cuff on that. I actually had people handing me bananas for the rest of the conference, which was really funny. Bill Hamilton, I'm looking at you if you're in the crowd here. Um, and so extemporaneous tends to go off the cuff a little bit and everyone's going to be a little bit different. Some people say, you know, our group really wants someone who's memorized and at the podium and, and doing it that way. And then some people want the high energy um, extemporaneous. And then some groups are okay with, with having someone who's a bit more impromptu as well. There's there's so many different speaking styles and it's kind of, a, you're going to find a mishmash. You've got people who are humorous. There are storytellers. There are people who tell with emotion. I tend not to get emotional on stage. I, that's just how I am, but other people do. And you might even see them in tears on stage. And if that works for your group, that's great, but that does not work for every group. Some are very content rich. So it's like, let me tell you 8,000 things. Like when I go up on stage, I tend to, <laughs> and actually Chrissy Osborne's like this too. She's one of our speakers. They give so much information, Michelle Loretta too, in 60 minutes that you feel like you've just run a content marathon, but that works for a lot of people, especially if they follow up with great, great, um, you know, worksheets after that. And then there are people who are inspirational and that's a whole other side of things where they come in and you, you might walk away two or three things you've learned, but you feel very different about, you just get really inspired by that, which is great as well. Um, you know, it just really depends on what you're looking for. And last but least, interaction as well. Um, some people say, you know what, I really in my group want to make sure there's a lot of interaction with the crowd that works better. I know Meryl Snow does a great job with that. Um, Megan Neely over here does not do good with that. Uh, you put me in a room for 60 minutes and I'm literally going to talk for 60 minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for the crowd once, but then we'll do a and a potentially. Um, so everyone's going to be different, but I want you to start thinking about that. I bring up these speaking styles simply for you to think about them and say, you know what, this has worked really well. Or maybe when this person came in, the impromptu nature, the humor just didn't, it kind of fell flat. It, you can just really think about that as well. But I like to put those out there as well. Also, are they a right fit for me? Don't be afraid to dig in a little bit. Look at their site. Look at LinkedIn. Um, where have they spoken? You know, great example. I've got Christy Race over here. She, I saw her the first time at B Sage and then at Engage, and it was like she really resonated great with that crowd. So if you find that those kind of groups are are going to resonate well with your local chapters, then be mindful of that. Are they in the trenches? This is kind of you know, get me with a glass of wine or good craft beer. We could talk about this for two hours. Is you know, there's a big talk right now about do my speakers have to literally be in the industry, working the industry right now in the trenches? Is there more value to that? People are looking for it because you've got consultants who are on the road all the time. And then you've got people who are literally in the throes of it every week being like, yeah, I totally get it when you say that. And so you have to ask yourself how important that is to you. Most people will say it's good to have a mix. And I would tend to agree with that. And then finally, snoop on their Insta, look at their YouTube, um, see if they are speaking, like see if you can get some videos, get to know their 
personality. Um, everyone, most of these folks are going to have kind of a personal brand out on their Instagram. Some of them are on Facebook Live a lot. Just make sure you reach out and really get a better feel for what their personality is because that's going to help a great deal with you determining whether it's a fit for your group. Now, in terms of reaching out for your key details, what are you looking for? This is actually our own site. We have speaker profiles where we put all the key information. Not everybody, of course, is going to have that, but I would definitely go ahead and if you are looking at speakers with their own personal pages, there are going to be things that you're going to be looking for. Of course, you're going to be asking for upcoming availability. Most speakers are not going to have availability calendar. Some people will include upcoming dates of where they are booked, but bear in mind, if you're working with someone who is in the trenches, so to speak, like there's going to be ones who they're not going to be available because they're working events as well. So reaching out and, and getting to the nitty gritty right away. Asking about available topics. So most of the time, what you see is what you're going to get, but a lot of speakers are going to be willing to be a little bit more flexible on that. I will say that, and this is strictly for myself, if someone is working within a budget and they come to me and say, listen, we can't do exactly your speaker's fee, but we can do X, Y, and Z, and it's very close. What's nice about that is I might be able to say, hey, listen, I've got these three topics. They're turnkey. I can make a couple of adjustments for you, but other than that, you know, we need to stick to those. Well, that's going to be a different rate than someone who comes to me and want something completely redone. So just be mindful of that. You're going to want to go ahead and ask them what their rates as well as their expenses are going to be. Rates typically are going to be a flat fee. So those flat fees could range. Um, don't ask me what the range is really because I mean I've seen people who offer a nominal honorarium from three to five hundred dollars. Some people and then they go all the way up to in the thousands and it just depends on what what you know it's like experience and how much time it takes if you're looking to be created for a brand new topic that's going to cost a heck of a lot more than someone who's coming in with a turnkey topic and you're also going to have some speakers who come with their own sponsors which help offset the cost and then you're also going to have speakers as well um, who are willing to offer maybe a nice discount or maybe offer a deal um, as well so it just really depends but find out what that is and then also you want to dive into what their expenses are that ties into travel and accommodations this is where it sounds like this is what we don't always think about so first and foremost with travel, get very clear with them immediately. What in the world does travel mean? Are you doing a flight? Is it train? Is it, are you driving and I'm covering mileage? Guys, when it comes to a flight, you need to really talk to people and say, what are your average flight costs right now? Because that's that's actually what we do when these chapters reach out. We actually get average costs um, in real time for people. But you need to make sure, are we talking about coach? Are they expecting first class? Because some people, I mean, some people do. I don't, by the way, but some people do. <laughs> you be mindful of that. With your accommodations, you need to ask, are you staying one night or two? Because if you're on the East Coast and you're flying in someone from West Coast or vice versa, very rarely can they only stick to one overnight. I mean, I've done it to California. It ain't pretty at the end of the day when I'm getting back. I look like a zombie. But you want to talk with them and say, how many nights are you expecting? Is it two? Um, bearing in mind, too, some people may stay a little bit longer. And if they do, you need to negotiate, making sure they know when the hotel is up to them versus them. Also with expenses, you need to talk about transportation to and from the airport. That's something that's often missed. And you know, it could be $35, $40 with a lift or even more with a taxi or as an association, like one of the board members going to come pick them up. What about meals? Are you doing a per diem? Is like for me personally, I do a flat fee and it's all worked into that because I, I'll do travel accommodations, but then I won't charge um, I might do the airport transfer, but then I'm not going to charge for meals if I'm there a couple of days. Like, I'll just work it into my fee. So it's not like, I don't know. You just have to be careful. Everyone's a little bit different. But knock out every single expense you're going to be expecting because I can't tell you how many times people get thrown off when, when they've got a tight budget. And they go, oh, I didn't think about, you know, the airport or getting them back and forth. I didn't think about X, Y, and Z. Um, when it comes to overnight accommodations too, you'll have to see if they have preferences. So some people, if they're traveling a lot, say, oh, I prefer Hilton Property or a Marriott. Most people won't be picky, though. They're going to be appreciative of the overnight accommodations, but you, there may be requests, and, and I'll talk about that with the speaker agreement as well. AV requirements. I am not going to push too far on this right now because we are going to dig into AV requirements. But AV requirements, if there's anything out of the ordinary, you need to know that up front. Most people are going to need a speaker. I mean, excuse me, most people are going to need a screen and a projector of some sort. You know, it depends on what you're looking for. They're going to need a mic. Some people are going to ask for more than that, though. Some people, especially at a particular level, might require staging. And that, that's not a lot of people for the local niche chapters, but don't be surprised by that. That's what I would <laughs> 
<laughs> like ask up front if someone's already charging x amount of dollars you'll just need to make sure you know what that is and then also key details guys this is so important exclusivity of topic and you think what in the world does this mean but if i and i'm just making this up if i'm in atlanta and i'm just saying Atlanta it doesn't mean anything but I'm in Atlanta and I book this topic and it's on X Y and Z you want to make sure that that person's not coming back to Atlanta to speak within a period of time you don't want to be unreasonable about it but typically six months prior or after would you just got to be careful because what's the point in bringing them twice to your local market that's what we do we actually have this very obnoxious spreadsheet where we're tracking all our speakers right now because you know if a society of blah 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 in the Atlanta market wants Merrill Snow, but Merrill Snow's coming to Atlanta Nace or whatever, you have to be very mindful of what that looks like and the spread out of time and what are the topics just so we're not stepping on anybody's toes. So be very mindful of that. You also want to be mindful of if they've booked any recent conferences. Let's say you're in Las Vegas, right? And Wedding MBA is there every year and they've got Wedding MBA coming up in a couple of months. Well, you don't want to book them for the same exact topic because maybe a lot of locals are going to Wedding MBA. So just be really mindful. That's something that people don't think of very very often when it comes to that. Now, let's dig into the speaker agreement as well. I would highly encourage you to have a speaker agreement in place. Um, all of our speakers with winning industry speakers, are, my lawyer put one together and everyone has a license to it. And it took a while to put this together because the fact is, I, I don't think speakers, and I also don't think that the associations cover themselves enough because we don't know what we don't know. We think everything's gonna just be peachy keen, but things happen, um, acts of God happen, and we have to make sure that we're covered for all of those things. And so um, this is just literally a snippet of my fairly extensive, <laughs> but not intimidating contract to make sure we cover everything. Things that you wanna cover, the exact date and time. That sounds crazy, you're like, obviously, people often forget the time. And that's important because if you have someone within driving distance and they've covered something earlier in the day, that's something you have to be careful of. Great example, I'm speaking at Richmond May, September 24th. I'm also doing a webinar at, at two o'clock that day. So I, I have to do evening and not daytime. And so we've got to be mindful of that. You want to put down the topic and description and be very clear what this person is talking about. Now, can you make tweaks afterwards? Absolutely. That's not to say you can't, but let's just make sure everyone's clear on what it is that you're covering. Also, the length of the presentation. Can you change it later? Yes, but let's not have any surprises. Know if it's 45 minutes, an hour, hour 15. Most of them don't run more than 45 to 75 minutes. So making sure you've covered that because if you thought you were doing a half hour work, I mean, excuse me, you're, have, you're doing a half day workshop that's very different than a 45 minute keynote. Likewise, believe it or not, 45 minutes and 75 minutes are very, very different in terms of what a talk, like what a talk looks like. So you also, once again, want to run through AV needs and be very clear who is supplying the, the computer, who's supplying, um, we'll talk about Max in a few minutes, um, the cords and all those things so that there's just no surprises, no additional fees for you guys. Because again, we're all on a budget. That's the speaker. And that also means the association. Make sure you're clear travel, hotel, and airport transfer. You may not, have, obviously you're not gonna book it till afterwards, but you at least wanna cover, like our agreement will say um, that we're looking, it has to be a hotel. We're not looking, we're not doing an Airbnb. Like I actually did a conference recently after my agreement, like I signed with them before my agreement <laughs> was made. And they ended up putting us in like a cabin that we shared and it was, it actually ended up being really great, but there was almost a chance I wouldn't get a room to myself in, in, I would have been with mainly strangers. And so lesson learned on my side is we update and we're saying, listen, we're, we're looking for a hotel. Um, we don't necessarily need five star, but like three, four star minimum, you know, average rating reviews of X, Y, and Z on TripAdvisor. And that just protects everyone. So people aren't put in some weird part of town where it doesn't make sense. And, you know, you just have to be careful with that sort of thing. And then also with travel, you may want to talk about, well, it's going to be up to $400, $500. It's going to be on American Airlines and it has to be booked within a certain time. Um, and then be clear in airport transfer again. So no one's surprised and you're not paying extra later on down the road. So here is the not so obvious stuff that's not always in. And guys, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, exclamation point. So get with a lawyer if you need to, or work with a speaker that already has a professional contract and this will be helpful. So who owns the rights to the talk? You know, if you're getting it recorded, are they allowed to share it? Can it be filmed? Because technically if I'm presenting, I own the rights to 
my talk, but am I allowing you to fill it, film it? Am I allowing you to put it into a database for other members to be able to um, take care of that? And so make sure that you cover your bases. There's no right answer with that. It's just you have to determine what it is. Travel, who's booking it? So we talk about travel, but then who in the world is booking it? If it's going to be a flight, if it's a hotel, most of the time the hotel accommodations, oftentimes with NACE, it's going to be a sponsorship, uh, which is so amazing and, and so great of the hotel um, hoteliers to do that. But sometimes it's paid as well. And either way it's paid, but you know what I mean. And so who's booking that and when is that being booked, but also travel. So is the speaker going to book it and then ask for reimbursement on site? I tend to do it that way. Um, I didn't realize I was picky about my travel until um, I, I work with the Knot and Wedding Wire on their newly joined team <laughs> and they book for me now. And so I didn't realize how picky I was about all of it until... I was, and so you find that speakers may want to say, hey, I'll book it, I'll run the flight by you ahead of time. If you approve it, I'll book it and ask for reimbursement. Um, some speakers would prefer not to do that, so it just really depends, but you guys need to talk about that. Also, the employment status of the speaker, they're a contractor at the end of the day, so it needs to be outlined as such. Um, and when is the speaker being paid or reimbursed? Uh, for myself, I either will ask for the um, payment one week prior or on site, but it's like I won't go on stage if I'm not being paid. You have to be mindful of that, especially if there's reimbursement involved. So make sure you guys, that's like the not so obvious stuff you need to make sure that you run through. Now, let's talk about audiovisual. And I'm going to pick on Kevin Dennis for a second, one of our speakers, because he actually owns Fantasy Sound. So he's like the perfect speaker with audiovisual because he knows all of it. <laughs> I thought he was like a good poster child for this slide. So, um, so when it comes to audiovisual, this will make or break it period. I can't stress this enough um, because speakers, I, I joke that we're like junior varsity audiovisual technicians because there are times I'll walk into a room and there's no AV person at, at all. And so then I have to hook it up and that's not what I do for a living. So I'm not so great at it. Um, but I've been put in rooms that uh, the audiovisual hasn't been great. Um, not to pick too much on this experience, but a bunch of years ago, we I was kind of one of the beta testers for putting us in um, with the trade show. And it, at the end of the day, it worked very well, but the audio visual actually had some problems with it and I feel like I can share that a few years later because those who saw me saw that but also it, it gives good feedback to Nice not to probably do that again in the future um, and so with that audiovisual really like the microphone wasn't working very well the acoustics weren't great and so even though we made the best of it and it turned out to be one of my favorite talks I ever did um, it does impact heavily the speaker and if you guys are spending the money to bring in a speaker you want to make sure they have um, the basics there so in terms of what you supply here are the things that you need to make sure. And guys, I'm actually, I've created an audio visual checklist for you. So I'm very excited about that. So you can take a look at it. Um, you can download it. It's actually, it's part of the handout. So this is what you supply. You can supply um, typically a screen as well as the projector. And there's, and that kind of sounds old school. There's various different ways depending on the side, but that, that stuff is the meat and potatoes. Um, oftentimes a speaker will provide their own laptop, the laptop and the charger for it. If you want the presentation in advance, you can put it on your own. I actually did that recently. Um, Nace Houston, quick shout out, love those guys. Uh, they were running a presentation in advance on their own computer, so it made sense for me to supply the presentation so they wouldn't have to change computers. Totally fine with that, just make sure you outline it. Um, we'll talk about Macs in a second, but typically if a computer um, being brought on site is a Mac, then the adapters are handled by the speaker, and we'll, we'll get into that, that craziness in a second. You're also going to supply a microphone, even in a room with only 20, 25 people. Um, recently, um, Morgan on the, NACE, I, the national board kind of gave me crap in a room because she did an amazing presentation at NACE Experience, um, and, did, and it was a small, like, it was like this more intimate room, and it was filled to the brim, and she didn't want to use a microphone, and I made her. Thank you very much, but um, it, because it sounds good, even in more intimate space when you've got 30 people it still sounds better and it's great for recording so you want a microphone you want to make sure that you can provide sound and Wi-Fi as well and you want to ask your speaker ahead of time those are things I tend not to need Wi-Fi or sound I don't do video I've only done video once for winning MBA because it was required because I find god I just want it as simple as possible I want me on stage with good content a few slides with cat pictures on it and call it a day because I like the fewer things you the fewer bells and whistles you add the fewer issues that you're going to have um so make sure you you need to supply that 
also it never hurts to have a slide changer guys it never hurts to have a slide changer that people can use because i can't tell you how many times i go on site and you know there won't be a slide changer and i'll provide my own so don't assume the speaker will have one like it, it's a nice add on to have that and then staffing you're going to find that it's going to be best to have an audio visual technician there to check with the speaker about 30 minutes to an hour before the actual talk people are surprised by that sometimes i'll come on site and there won't be anyone to do that and you really do need someone i mean ideally you need someone staffed through the entire event of course but but if you're on a budget bare minimum you have to make sure there's someone to check in so those are some of the basics that you need to be super super mindful here's not so obvious things like other stuff it's like oh i i need to do that but screen placement guys screen placement is key i learned this a long time ago if you set up a screen in the front of the room behind the speaker more than likely you won't have a teleprompter like i've had a few i think houston might have but most places won't have a teleprompter that's always ideal but it's not realistic and so um, your screen, you do not want it directly behind the speaker. Why? Because if you have someone who's moving around, one, they're going to block it, and two, they're not going to be able to see their slides. Um, even for the best of us who are, are memorized or extemporaneous, we still need to be able to see our slides, and you don't want us turning around looking at them. So, And you can't assume, like most people, you're going to want to find this out about your speaker, they're going to be walking around, a lot of them will be, and so they're not going to be at the podium looking at their laptop. And now more than ever, a lot of times the laptop's not even at the um, podium anymore so be ideally you want it off to the side a little bit so it's kind of catty corner so that your audience can see it but also the speaker um, can reference it without having to turn around room setup typically for nice it's going to be of course um, you're going to see that it, it it really depends. it's going to be paired with a meal and so you're going to want the rounds or crescent rounds like in a perfect world you could set it up where you have enough um, seats of course for everyone round tables but set it up as a crescent style so that everyone can look seen forward and there's enough room for them to eat as well but it really depends on the space as well now if somehow food is not paired with it classroom styles always better than theater styles so that people can take notes and make it easier now i would also contend and i'm sure some people will fight me on this is if you do have a classroom style setup up, what stinks is people go on their computers and maybe they're not paying attention the way they should. So other thing, guys, request the presentation in advance. A professional speaker is going to be fine with that. Ask for it one to two weeks out so you can take a peek at it, not because you're trying to micromanage, but you just all want to be on the same page, making sure that it covers what you want. And, um, you know, some of you guys, the funny thing about NACE is some of you are very like wedding social leaning and then other groups are more corporate leaning. It's very, very different. I find that it depends on like what else is in town and so if that's something that you need to talk about and you're like listen i can't have a lot of wedding stuff or vice versa look at the slides in advance make sure that they look good um and then also make sure you tell them and i didn't put this on here but this is important um slide sizes uh slides these days are um there's four four by three ratio and which was the standard for a long time and now there's widescreen this is in this is four by three today but it looks like it probably would accommodate 16 by nine which is widescreen talk to people about that that does does make a difference and that can't be changed at a moment's notice in terms of what it looks like um let's talk about Macs for a second and the problem with them um i put a sad mac up here um in just here okay max most people use max <laughs> but it but the world of presentations are very behind on that and so if someone is bringing a mac and this is like if you forget everything else today i want you to remember this if someone's bringing a mac it should be their responsibility to bring the connectors, the adapters, um, we call them dongles as well, that need to connect to your in-house AV. That is essential. The right person, all of our speakers do this. We, they all bring their own adapters because that's gonna be essential. Um, Macs in the last few years have changed enough. Um, I used to, there used to be one that I used for everything. And then when I changed and I got, I think my computer's from 2017 now, like a new, relatively newer one. Now I have three separate adapters I have to bring on site. So guys, make sure, find out, are you bringing a Mac? If you're bringing a Mac, let's talk about the adapters to make sure you have everything you need because that, that will ruin it. I have literally seen this will be anonymous, but I have literally seen people on stage at national conference, not anyone I'm working with, but will literally say to the crowd, I don't have an adapter, does anyone have one? And I've given them away a handful of times as well because people don't realize they need it on site. So be mindful of that. Also guys, remember a speaker doesn't just speak. They can be there for a number of different reasons. I mentioned this with my description when I was sending it over to Amanda. Um, 
So when it comes to speakers, you need to be mindful of the fact that you want to utilize them to the best of your ability. So if you have an ACE blog locally, talk to them before you go to contract. Are they willing to write something? If they're a thought leader, they should have snippets already that might match along with that. I often offer that. I actually do that for an ACE experience. Like I'll offer to write something. Um, but you can also use them for a VIP reception. This is such a great idea. I'm seeing more and more people do where um, I was actually at an event. It wasn't, it wasn't an ACE event, but I was in Minnesota. I did a panel in January and it was myself and a bunch of editors like Martha Stewart Weddings, the Knot, like a really great, I was very honored to be a part of it. And so what they did is they sold tickets, but then they actually charged a little bit additional for people who wanted to come ahead of time and they kept it limited to like 15 people and who wanted to be with the speakers ahead of time. So remember the speaker doesn't just speak, they can mingle, they can write, they can do videos, like make sure that you've really talked about all the ways you can maximize working together. Next, now booked. This is where the real work begins. What you want to do is make sure you review the topic at length with them. Topic description is typically a paragraph plus three to four takeaways. Usually they supply that well in advance when you're booking. Make sure you review it and see if you have any issues with it. Um, and that's important to do. I'll give you a great example. Um, I'm speaking at Winning MBA this fall and Shannon gave me the topic and then we had to make some tweaks on it because a couple of them, they're very good, but they were not in my area of expertise. So we reworked them a little bit and it's important you do that really in advance so that when you start promoting that that description is very accurate so that when people are making an informed decision about whether or not to come, they know exactly what's being covered. So review that at length, jump on a call for 15 minutes, firm up the AV, discuss any challenges. Listen, are you going to have video? Are you going to have sound? Are you bringing a Mac? Do you need us to provide it? Like, let's go through it. Talk about the timing as well when it comes to all of that, because you know, in a perfect world, and you guys are all event pros, so you know this, is ideally the speaker is speaking during dessert or after the meals have been served, because if you can preach set dessert oftentimes, and just so there's no clearing during, because it gets really, really chatty as well. Um, grab the bio and headshot for promotion. That's going to be essential. Make sure, I, it's so funny to me how many times I see NACE events and also other industry events that don't include the bio of the person. It's like, hey, if you're bringing in, like we have the picture of Christy Rice coming in here. It's like, yeah, she's a celebrity stationary person. She's done a ton of crazy good stuff. Like you should know about her very, very extensive background before you jump into this um, as well. So make sure you include that. Headshot should be high res, minimally one megabyte. And, and we do for literally like 90% of our speakers. Um, but make sure I think a great headshot really does make a difference. Speaking as a person who spent like a half a day having my headshots done and posing like crazy to make myself look a certain way, <laughs> to have me look a certain way for these, but it does, does make a difference to have these great headshots. Um, also, don't be afraid for them. Uh, tell them about your organization. This is actually a form we use and we offer up to all our speakers. So when they book with an organization like NACE, our speakers can send this to the NACE chapter and say, hey, can you fill this out? It'll take five minutes. Gives me a better idea. Have them know what's the average attendance at the meetings? What speakers have you, you know, what speakers have, are you booking? Have you been booking? Um, do you, when would you prefer the speaker presentation sent along to you? Tell us a little bit about what's worked in the past. Like you don't need to name names, but tell us what worked in what didn't. So um, see if you can give them, because if you're not booked with one of our speakers, you won't get that link. So make sure that you're offering that information. Now, when it comes to promotion best practices, include a full description, not just the bio, but make sure you include their background in a full description paragraph plus um, three to four takeaways. Add those takeaways in there. That's going to be essential because you want people to look at it. Like the last thing you want is for someone to come and be fully disappointed because of the, they thought the topic was about something entirely different. And don't be afraid to ask the speaker to do a quick video, whether they keep it informal, they can do it on their phone, um, which I know makes people shudder. Like, film filmmakers, but you know, quick and dirty. I use Zoom. Zoom has a free option. I use a paid option where I can record and send something out. It's just to show that kind of experience, get you excited about it. Um, but absolutely go ahead and do that. I can't also say enough good things about Canva. So um, one of the things that we offer with our speakers is if you want, we can provide you know, these great like Instagram ready, Facebook cover ready, you know, what have you, but having those sort of things that are shareable do make a difference. This is the one on the right that I did for work-life balance for, of course, experience. And on the left was um, my uh, Brittany, 
Dry with Love Inc. actually recently did that for one of the Nice Hangout webinars. And so see if there's something they can provide, or if not, you guys, Canva can, I have, the paid version is pretty cool, but the, the free one is going to be fine. Like it will get you, like they have great templates and all those things so that you can go ahead and use those so that people can have it. It really is eye-catching. Again, it's why it's very important to have wonderful headshots. Now, one to two weeks uh, prior, set up a brief call to connect any further questions. Like when I, as a speaker, talk to people, I typically go, all right, like I need to know. And I go through a million things. Like, can you send me the, the final agenda? Who's my key point of contact? Can I have the cell phone of the person who's going to be there? Who should I check in with when I land? Like who needs to know that stuff? So I'm not like jumping in at the last minute. Grab their introduction, usually a couple of paragraphs to get them introduced. Ideally in a perfect world, I always say, introduce the speaker, make sure all that information's out. So when the speaker starts speaking, they don't go through their bio again. That's one of my um, pet peeves. I hate that. I, I, it's like, you, if you've already given someone's bio, you've already introduced them, we don't need to go into their background any further. Send that agenda so that they can see, when are you speaking? When should you be there? When should you check in for audio visual? Now, a question I get a lot of the time is, should I attend attendee or should I send attendees in advance? I'm a big fan of this. Now, don't send the emails, like unless that's in the agreement. Send the list of who's attending, what's their name and their company, and if you do have it available, their URL. Give them an idea who's gonna be there. Are we looking at primarily caterers, venues? Is it a quarter photographers? Are there people from out of town? Like that helps the speaker. And I know you can't send that to last minute you know, typically it's like, I mean, we all know event pros are terrible at RSVPing. <laughs> Don't be offended. You know, that's true. And, and so to be able to send that a couple days out is very helpful. Next, look at the slides. Are there too many? Are there not enough? Express your concern ahead of time. Like, I did for one, I did for Cater Source, right? I did um, 60 minutes and it was, and I typically do one slide a minute, like on average, I did 91 slides for trends. And so I got called out on that ahead of time. Like, can you do that and not make it seem like a big old slideshow, like slide, slide, slide. And I, and yes, I could. And thank you very much. I did a good job at that. But um, be, don't be afraid to ask if it looks like it's too many or what if it's not enough? And somebody might say, oh, I'm just very conversational. I'm more extemporaneous. So I don't have a lot of my slides, but talk about that. Is it too wordy per slide? Is it not enough? What about their use of graphics? Man, if their graphics are, are blurry or the graphics have gone through a bit of watermark, and I don't mean a watermark like a photography credit. I mean, like one of those stupid watermarks because they didn't pay money like the dollar to download it be mindful of that call them out on that their overall design is it too much is it too little does it does it look professional enough like have that conversation you guys are paying for that investment so don't be afraid now let's talk social five out of ten um, speakers will use social throughout the event to engage so I want you to be mindful of that and know with that in mind give the speaker any hashtags or social media handles in advance. Let them have it. Um, have someone on site. I love when I go to an event and Denise, uh, whoever's doing marketing, which was actually fun fact, the first thing I did, um, when I was on the Richmond Ace board back in the, it was my first and only job, but I was, I was in marketing, um, you know, having that person on site so that they're sharing everything. But, you know, like I, as a speaker, I'll go ahead and make sure I'm posting on like Instagram and Insta stories, maybe Facebook live, make sure in, in like, I'll get those hashtags ahead of time. So at the ready, like to start sharing those and, and you want to give people FOMO people that like the people who didn't make it, you want to make sure they sign up for the next time as well. So now what? These are the things you need to start thinking about. Um, I want you to think about your chapter goals. I want you to go ahead and get yourself organized. Like, do you need to set up a form? Do you need to get with someone about, you know, the support for having a speaker agreement? Um, you want to make sure you start beginning your outreach. If you haven't for 2020, do not worry about it. Some of you guys are still booking this fall. That's fine. But start reaching out because some of these speakers, like, not, not to whatever, but like I just booked Seattle. I booked several months ago, Seattle Nace for August, 2020, which is an outlier. I, I, you know, I've booked people within three to four months before, but there are going to be people that are harder to book because, you know, they've had had the accolades and experience or the speaker of the year nomination. And so you want to get with them, of course, as well. You want to revisit your speaker agreement, your AV checklist, and just your general process. And with that, um, just a quick shout out. And guys, stick with me until the end because we actually have this pretty crazy, exciting offer for you. So with wedding industry speakers, which we, we do all sorts of wedding and corporate event kind of talks, hopefully you'll give us a look. It's so easy. Literally send in your request for what you're looking for. Like 
hey, I'm a program chair, I'm the president, I'm looking for these three topics, these three dates are still available, and then what we do is we can either connect you with our writer, our, our speakers, or what we do more often, it's almost like an RFP, is we'll supply a document to you, a legit document that says, oh, you want June 5th next year? Here are the three speakers available, this is their fees, this is their travel, these are their requirements, so then you guys can decide how you want to proceed. Um, all of our folks have legal professional speaking contracts. We do have resources such as we'll, we will do you know, promotion for you guys, we can create those for you, um, but we do have the resources to make sure you can maximize your investment. Also guys, I have made you an AV checklist, so you're going to see I have a couple of different things on the right side here. We have a one sheet that we give every time one of our speakers is booked and it's how to maximize your your investment with them and it does talk about some of the things we've talked about today as a friendly reminder we do have an AV list as well um, that you can download along with the slides on the right. And before we wrap up, and thank you for sticking um, along with me as well, this is very important. Before we get into my inspirational quote at the end, we are going to be promoting this, guys. I love working with Nace. I've been with Nace for 10 years. I've done all sorts of different things with you guys. I was so proud to be a sponsor of Nace Experience this year. What we are doing is this. So we are offering this to all chapters, all Nace chapters. If you book, our speakers, start booking our speakers. It could be one, you could book five of them. It's whatever you want. Between now and September 15th that you've got a signed contract with these guys. It could be for October of this year. It could be for June of 2020. I don't care what the date is, but every time you book one of our speakers and you're gonna see they're an amazing list and we will go ahead and put your name into a drawing. And so I'm gonna have this very geeky spreadsheet, all the different chapters who are booking. We've got some people who've already reached out. So guys, if you're on the call, I'm gonna be reaching back out to you. Every time you book a speaker, you'll get one additional, your name up there. We will do a random lottery after the 15th. And what that will be is um, the person picked first will get $750. We will write a check from wedding industry speakers to your chapter. You can put it toward your education fund. It can help offset the cost of speakers coming in. It could be used for whatever you want for your chapter. We're gonna pull a second name, that's gonna be for 500. We're gonna pull a third name, and that is gonna be for 250. And then everyone who books a speaker, I'm not kidding you, I am sending you your very own slide changer. This amazing slide changer I use all the time, so now you can put it in your little arsenal and say, oh, I've got my slide changer already. So we are doing that for you guys. We are so excited about this. So if you book our speakers between now and September 15th for any date, as long as you sign on the dotted line by now, you're going to be put in this lottery and we will be writing checks after the 15th. We'll make an announcement. We'll do a geeky Facebook Live or something like that with cats. I don't know. And then from there, we'll go ahead and write checks that you guys can go ahead and make that investment back into your education. I feel that strongly about how wonderful our speakers are. So I'm super excited to offer that. And just remember, my, one of my favorite quotes, education is not the filling of a pail, it is the lighting of a fire. It is so important to have great education. And I'm deeply appreciative of the people who stuck in with me today. Here's my contact information if you need anything. So this QR, co QR code is, if you hold your phone up to it, hold up your camera to it. You don't need a QR reader, just hold your camera up to it. It will take you to, I am starting that next month in celebration of having my gallbladder taken out. I'm just kidding. It just happens to be the same month I'm doing that. But I am starting, um, I have a quarterly newsletter that's going out to program chairs, chapter leaders, that will literally be all the great information, downloads, here's what you need to know about booking speakers, here's what's coming out, here you go from there. So go ahead, that will help you sign up. Um, and then I'm good to go from there. And you know, Amanda, I'm gonna change the presenter. I'm still waiting on kittens here. So I'm gonna hand this back to you. <laughs> I'm handing it back and we're going to see if we can find a kitten that we can hold up to the screen here. Yes, please. <laughs> I think everyone yeah, I'm like walking kitten. around. I'm like, where's the kittens? So for some of my folks who, oh, I don't see them. I think they're all napping right now. So sorry, guys. No, no kittens, but they are, they are running around here. Oh, um, Megan, um, Marcy just said that she, the QR expired. That's oh no. Okay. We'll go ahead and, oh, that's embarrassing. Go ahead and email me. Um, Marcy, I'm so sorry. Can you go ahead and just email me your email? I will go ahead and add you to the list. I'm sorry about that. The best laid plans. I added that QR code at the last minute and did not realize I had a, uh, so there you go. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, Yes, please email Megan. She will get that to you and sign you up for yeah. that. Um, oh, and then there, if there's any questions, I have a couple for you. Okay. Um, how do you recommend working with a panel speaker style, like setting it up? Um, uh, reviewing that's a tough one. You know, panels, 
uh, panels are really, really tough. The key to a great panel, everyone's going to think I say this panel, the key to a great panel is a great moderator, period. Like I am, I have done panels for, I've done them for NACE, I've done them TSC, with like all these different things, and it comes down to a great, great person. So first, you need it comes down to what's the goal of this? What's because we actually had a really great panel at Richmond Nace. We we were so lucky because we're a smaller chapter, right? We don't we're not gonna have billions of dollars here in terms of like spending to bring in all these people. But we were so lucky that we had a lot of great within driving distance uh, wedding bloggers and we're in editors, and we're like we need to do something about this. We need to get creative. So the, you have to ask what your overall goals are to start here, and ask what your budget's gonna be because. Because with panels, you're paying potentially, because if you've got, panels are usually good with a moderator and three to four panelists. You never want to go over that, especially if you've got some chatty Cathy's here. And so um, you have to be mindful of what you're budgeting for that, because it gets very expensive if you're flying in people from all over. You know what I mean? So you have to make sure it's really gangbusters or you're bringing in some really great people regionally as well. And so you need to know what the topic is, like really clear, what's the topic? Really, you want to consider what that description and takeaway, instead of the speaker supplying it to you, what is that topic description that you you want to put together so that you can fill in the blanks. A moderator, ideally you want someone who's done it before, who understands that, you know, I'm a big believer in making sure you've got someone who can keep it organized, you know, invest in them a little bit, make sure they understand that they're potentially the ones who are going to go ahead and offer, um, whether it's a PowerPoint or a keynote to keep it organized. Um, when you find panelists, you need to find people who, and it, they don't have to be really experienced speakers. They could be really great experts who don't even have a ton of experience on stage. In fact, that's probably ideal. Um, you want to avoid people who are going to take over, frankly. I, I have gone, I, <laughs> it's not an ACE event. I did one years ago where I got, it was like all these people got brought in and then we sat there and we went, it was like editors. On, and this one dude who I don't think is in the business anymore, he talked the entire, there was no room for anybody else. A good moderator will regulate that though and be mindful of that, but just be mindful of personalities when you're coming in. From there, make sure you're very streamlined with co collecting their information so that you can promote them as a whole. I tend to suggest that, and usually that's why you put in the hands of the moderator, have a PowerPoint. I believe in having a PowerPoint or, or keynote, guys. I use those interchangeably. Have a presentation deck so that it's even the basic title slide, um, one slide for each of them to introduce who they are, and then come up with like six to eight questions. Ask your members ahead of time what questions they want to ask. Put it in there so that it gets the conversation going. Have a moderator that can ask those questions. The questions go to the speakers in advance. They know not everyone has to answer them. And then you open it up to the floor, but you've got a good enough moderator that they have like a notebook with them or something. That's what I do. I have like an old fashioned notebook and pen and paper. And I'm taking notes so that I can ask follow up questions as well. So that really, and that's a great, God, I could do 45 minutes on just how to put together a great panel, but making sure that the, the key is a great moderator in that you've prepared your panelists ahead of time. You know what they're going to be covering, what they need to do, um, and we just don't want it. People throw together panels so much and they're terrible. Like so many, I pride myself on having great panels over the years. So yeah, um, I could talk about this, Amanda, forever, but that, that in whoever asked that question, that's an amazing question. Feel free to email me if you want to expand on that because I have a lot, I have a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and then there's another couple questions, which are, um, if you receive the slides a couple weeks out from your, uh, from your speaker and the talk just doesn't seem to have the right audience, where do you go from there? Okay. Well, and that's a great question because a lot of people think what they should do is panic, um, <laughs> which they do because it's like a week out and you're like, oh my God, um, this isn't what I wanted. First of all, calm down. That's It's going to be fine. A professional speaker wants to kick some butt with your organization. So you do not have to worry about it. Like you think about, like, take a look at it, be thoughtful about it. Don't be emotional about it. Be logical about it and ask her and don't panic and just ask yourself. And this is why you ask for it a, a few weeks in advance and say, okay, what are the things I'm concerned about? Because some of the things might be, it's too short. It's too long. It's too ugly. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's too whatever. So come up with that and, and start and say, hey, can we sit down and have a conversation and let them know and say, hey, 
I do have a few concerns and, and really focused on the fact this is collaborative. I want to make sure that you have the very best audience. I don't want to make sure they love you and we're all bringing value in, in all that stuff. So let's go through it together and just really express those concerns and say, and it could be, what about these slides? I'm concerned, you know, because our group is more focused on social and this has a lot of corporate examples and, and really come at it very collaborative if that's a real word and and just know that the right speaker is going to want to do their very 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 best for you especially those who are like the rising stars the ones who are newer to the and not seeing someone like myself who's been doing it a bunch of years doesn't want it but especially those newer folks it, they really want to make sure they're getting it right for everybody so yeah don't be afraid to have that conversation come to it with a collaborative but and don't panic don't put motion in it be logical write down your questions and, and you guys you'll be fine Great. Thank you. And then how many slides should the average presentation have for like an hour presentation? Is that oh, gosh. Everyone's different. Okay. Um, I tend to do one ish per minute, maybe a little bit under that. Some people need way less. Like I'd be concerned at an hour. If someone had under 15, I'd be like, can we talk about that? Because they might be more extemporaneous and me or memorized where they, they just don't need all of that. While other people might really load them down because they have a lot to cover and they want to make sure that, that it's covered on there. So I would say if you're at an hour and you, you see someone go over 60, you're going to want to ask about that or even at that 50 to 60. Or if they go under 15 to 20, you may want to say, hey, I just want to make sure if you've timed it because people going over, people going under, you don't want to spend a lot of money on someone who um, goes way under and you you just want to make sure it's very well timed. So that's a hard question. It, it really, cause I'm basically saying between 20 and 60, but, um, for me, I talk quickly and, and I tend to run 45 to 60 slides. Okay. Right. And then anything you suggest to have in a presentation emergency kit, um, for common challenges yeah. that may pop up? I'm so glad someone asked this. It reminds me of Nate's experience. And forgive me, I don't remember off the top that really wonderful um, group. I think it was the audiovisual folks, um, forgive me on this, who provided a, like an emergency kit up there. It was so cute. But yeah, there's a few things. If you're in a position to invest in this, um, again, I would go ahead and have a, a slide changer. There's one in particular I love. It costs you like 20 bucks, 20, $25 Logitech. Just have one of those. You'd be surprised how handy that comes in. <laughs> just so it's like done um if you can if you can budget for it, it, it having some of the most common mac adapters does not hurt to have just uh, yes the audiovisual companies think would supply it some of them do someone like kevin does but a lot of them do. it's crazy to me i i mean i still walk into a room when the av guy goes oh, i don't work with Macs a lot so just be mindful of that um you know making sure that you have little things like think about what would i have for an event emergency kit or like a wedding emergency kit little stuff stain remove stain stick removers last minute mints last minute you know this little toothbrush things that you can do last minute just little stuff like that for like anybody who I, I have been known to spill on myself before I go on stage I try not do that practically cover myself in a tablecloth if I'm eating before I go up on stage but some of those tech things really come in handle to you know if you can if you can allocate about a hundred dollars to have those in kind of your arsenal it really does make a difference okay so there's one more question and it's about uh, hi Megan, what about the tone of voice? And is it true that adding some sense of humor is always good? Tone of voice is really a good question. <laughs> I have so many thoughts. This is whoever did this. Thank you. This is a really great question. Let's talk about humor first. Humor only works if someone's funny. You know what I mean? Like Rachel Sheeran goes on stage and she's she's so good, right? She just wants beer. She's so good and she's funny and she's naturally funny. But then someone else may go on and, and you know who's funny? Meryl Snow's funny too. And so she goes on and you're like, oh my God. But then there are other people who just naturally don't aren't exuberantly funny. And if they try to tell jokes and it doesn't land, I mean, it just falls flat. And I'll be honest, there's times I'll say something that I thought was gonna be like it's done well in other markets and it completely falls flat. And then I I take any humor coming up, I just take out of the top. I'm like, oh, this crowd doesn't think this is funny at all. And so really, I'd almost start it back on you guys with your groups and ask yourself, are there people in the past who have been funny and it's worked out well versus like and, and how funny are they are they hearty har har is it like slipping in things like i do every now and then um but humor does not always work 
it does fall flat. Um, I tend to do more improv humor just by, na by nature of my personality and it works well for me, but it doesn't always work well for everybody else. So that's something. Now, when it comes to tone of voice, um, again, not to sound like a broken record, it does depend on the group um, and you really want to play to your strengths. I am just high energy by nature. And so high energy, um, you know, happy, that kind of just you like I come in a room and I'm a tornado works for me where it doesn't work for everybody else if there's someone who is pretty darn serious about what they do they just have to be mindful of the fact that hospitality folks that doesn't go over as well so when it comes to tone of voice you want to be educating without ever feeling like you're wagging fingers at, at the group of course right you don't want to feel like you're you're talking down to them um, but you want to be more collaborative about it um, I find that extroverts tend to do or, or even someone who can fake being an extrovert for you know 60 minutes that tends to do better um, you know that positive happy side of things as well um, it, I hope that helps a little bit but tone of voice really it's more about being authentic to your personality and hopefully if you're working with professional speakers you're going to be able to see videos of them ahead of time so it's very clear it's like oh okay this personality like does very well with this group versus others where it's like ooh, that's that's probably that's going to be a bit too much for us so I hope that helps. Please email me if you have more specific questions on that because I feel like speaking to an event group is very different than speaking to other kinds of um, industries. Great. Okay. Well, that we're right about time. Um, Megan, what can you provide your email really quick? Is that yeah? Um, it's it's right on the oh, it was Megan at OFDConsulting.com. Perfect. So Megan M E G H A N at OFDConsulting.com. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I am going to leave the video. Also, there's going to be a chapter leader news so you guys can see it there. Um, there's going to be a recording and um, we will also provide the information on um, the offer you have. Yes, I'm so excited. Thanks so much, guys. All right, thanks, Megan. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.